Hello there. In this video, I'm going to have an exam review session with a past paper. The paper is IB Economics Paper 1, HL, from May 22 exam. Let's give it a go. Question 1A. Distinguish between perfect competition and monopolistic competition. My intro will define monopolistic competition and perfect competition. And first, I can talk about features of perfect competition. This type of business has many small firms and uh, allowing free entry and exit, selling homogeneous products and allowing perfect knowledge. With the example of small food stand selling the very same menus, I know that this is gonna be really rare and unrealistic example, but I can say that this type of business structure is both allocatively and productively efficient. And such can be illustrated with a side-by-side -side diagram showing the industry and the firm in perfect competition. Next, I can talk about the features of monopolistic competition. Um, start with explaining the features of monopolistic competition, such as they have relatively uh, many firms and allow relatively easy entry and exit, but they have product differentiation and uh, they have a certain degree of market power and pricing power. The example I can use of the smartphone industry will have a few firms competing with product differentiation. I can conclude that this type of business is allocatively and productively not efficient, but it has normal profit in the long run. Last, I can draw a side-by-side -side diagram showing the industry and the firm in monopolistic competition. Question B, using real world examples, discuss the impact of large firms having significant market power. My intro will define market power and imperfect competition. First analysis is on negative impact of large firms having significant market power. I'm gonna use the business types of uh, collusive oligopoly or monopoly so that I can explain the possible welfare laws, the risks in relation to price, and output and consumer choice being limited and output less available. Also, I can talk about the possibility that such firms may pursue goals other than profit maximization, which can uh, somehow harm the consumer welfare. And then I can identify inefficiencies available to these type of firms, such as productive and allocative inefficiencies. Also, there should be a monopoly diagram showing higher price, and low quantities available and firms at normal profit and et cetera. And my real world example would be about the US regulators have sued Amazon, alleging that the internet giant is illegally maintaining monopoly power. Next analysis is on the positive impact of large firms having significant market power. I can explain potential positives such as economies of scale, including natural monopolies and abnormal profits that can be uh, financed to invest in R&D and innovation and all can lead to dynamic efficiencies. And then the diagram I'm gonna use is uh, the one that's showing economies of scale. And the real world example I'm gonna use is big firms like TSMC or Samsung have huge investment capacities. Specifically, TSMC currently ignites semiconductor renaissance in Japan uh, with new cheap plants and expansive investment spending. Question 2a, explain how the use of supply side policies might encourage greater domestic competition and improve the international competitiveness of a country. In the intro, I will define supply side policies and international competitiveness. And in body one, I can explain how supply side policies encourage greater domestic competition. First, there will be an explanation about how interventionist supply side policies such as government spending on education, training, R&D, and infrastructure can encourage greater competition on domestic industries. And then uh, I can further explain how market-based supply-side policies this time, such as privatization and deregulation, encourage greater competition in domestic industries. Also, uh, as a result of all the things that I have mentioned, more firms would compete and innovate, uh, which would encourage uh, productivity and efficiency in the production of goods and services, 
So all can be illustrated with a PPC diagram shifting outward. Next is about how supply side policies improve international competitiveness. Uh, I can explain how the great domestic competition achieved above one that I mentioned can boost international competitiveness. And I can explain how the use of additional market-based supply side policies, such as trade liberalization and anti-monopoly legislation, all those things can further improve international competitiveness. And this time I can use an ADAS diagram showing uh, SRAS or LRAS shifting to the right. Question B, using real world examples, evaluate the view that the use of interventionist supply side policies is the most effective way of reducing a country's rate of unemployment. Intra will define interventionist supply side policies and reducing unemployment as a macroeconomic objective. And first, I can argue that there are some agreeable points to the view. And to support the argument, I can explain how interventionist supply side policies increase the productive capacity of the economy, increasing the demand for labor in the long run, and thus lowering the level of certain types of unemployment, especially structural unemployment. To be more specific, government spending on education and training and R&D infrastructure all can contribute to decreased structural unemployment. Noticeable pros of the policy would be that uh, this one is stable and fundamental. And the use of um, ADAS diagram can support the idea by showing the LIAS being shifted to the right or PPC curve shift to the right. Um, my real world example would be India, which is uh, trying to invest on infrastructure projects, which is going to modernize passenger amenities and enhancing connectivity. Next, I can argue that there are some disagreeable points to the view as well. First, let me present the cons of interventionist supply side policies, such as time lags, administrative inefficiencies, and political motivation. And then I should explain other types of unemployment that would be not that effective to be solved with the uh, interventionist supply side policies uh, and other alternative policies that can work better. Uh, first, for friction on employment, maybe this time market-based supply-side policies can work better since uh, friction on employment is about the mismatch between uh, the labor demand and labor supply. And also for the cyclical unemployment, demand-side policies can work better because uh, it requires more direct and prompt measure to resolve that. So uh, last, I can talk about a real-world example, which is about Australia. The government is uh, conducting fiscal policies of providing childcare benefits and winding back business taxes. Thus, the country can keep unemployment rate below 4%, which is really good. Question 3A. Countries often specialize and trade according to the theory of comparative advantage, explaining the limitations of this approach. As always, intro will define the theory of comparative advantage and trade specialization. First body is about the assumptions underlying the theory and their limitations. The thing is, it only assumes that there are only two products being traded. Also, it assumes that firms are competing only according to the theoretical advantages, which means it does not include the transport costs of trade, or it does not consider various types of uh, other regulations or protectionism policies that would affect the firm's decisions of trading. And uh, as a result, all above can limit the real life application of the theory. And in second body, I can explain how it can lead excessive and unsustainable specialization. Specialization according to comparative advantage may not allow necessary structural changes to occur in an economy. It would let some countries, mostly like poorer countries, to be trapped in primary sector industries uh, and only benefiting richer countries and uh, multinational companies. 
And then I can draw such a situation with a PPC diagram to show the PPC's uh, disadvantage. Question B, using real world examples, discuss the advantages and disadvantages for a country of being a member of trading bloc. Intro will define trading block and types of it, such as common market or customs union or monetary union. And first, I can talk about the advantages of being a member of trading block. First, it would increase trade flows, which would lead economic growth, and it is bringing lots of consumer benefits, and it allows deeper economic integration and it attracts more investment. The real world example I can use is about the news that the UK officially joins Trans-Pacific Trading Bloc, the biggest trade deal since Brexit. And under the agreement, more than 99% of current UK goods export to their countries to be eligible for zero tariffs. Next is about the disadvantages of being a member of a trading bloc. First, there will be trade diversion, and we should expect that there can be displacement of domestic industries. Also, there can be loss of sovereignty, not to mention the economic disparities between member countries. The real world example that I'm going to use is the fact that there are 27 countries in the European Union, but eight of them are not in the Eurozone and therefore don't use the Euro. The eight countries choose to use their own currency as a way to maintain financial independence on certain key issues. Uh, I reckon this can be a counter example of demonstrating the disadvantage of being a member of trading bloc. All right, this is the end of people one. Thanks for watching. Bye.